It's a dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back from the place where fans and welcome once again to ring respect radio right here on the video bros network i am bobby munson and i'm joined as always by the man with the angelic voice the throat of the goat he is mr papa smokes papa smokes how you doing hey how you doing munson and how's everybody out there we hope everybody is doing well staying safe and enjoying some wrestling uh hopefully 2021 is bringing on a better year for anybody so happy new year from us here at the video bros network we're glad to be back ourselves right here, join some more wrestling and joy in talking to you here on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, make sure to hit the subscribe button down below and turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on the Video Bros Network. You can also check out past podcasts here from the Video Bros. Uh, past episodes of Ring Respect Radio are available both on YouTube and on Podbean through our good friends over at Backbreaker Media. And I just want to say on January 1st, 10 years since our buddy Mike the Ref, Mike being 10 years in this industry, doing what he does with video editing, commentary, being a referee, the whole work. So man, just from uh, from myself and I'm sure from Pop Smokes as well, congratulations on 10 years, Mike. Man, you got uh, skin of steel to be able to do this for 10 years. Yeah, congratulations, Mike. Great accomplishment and uh, let's look forward to the next step. Yeah, definitely so. So today on Ring Respect Radio, though, we are going to be doing some talking about, uh, in particular, Danny Hodge, a legend who just recently passed away. Uh, he passed on the passed away on the exact same day that Brody Lee did. So a lot of the news has been focused on Brody Lee, and uh, we're choosing to go the opposite. We're going to focus on Danny Hodge here on Ring Respect Radio. Uh, that has nothing to do with any opinions on Brody Lee or anything like that. I just want to say from myself and Papa Smokes, all the best wishes and uh, all the uh, heartfelt uh, love being sent out to the Hoover family. John Hoover passing away at 41. Uh, very tragic incidents, uh, incident here in the wrestling community. You have somebody go at such a young age there, Papa Smokes. It was uh, definitely definitely unexpected anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a huge fan of it's work or anything like that, but obviously a, a horrible shock incident that if him pass away uh, so unexpectedly at the age of 41, and uh, also shock uh, the fact that there really hasn't been a whole lot of uh, active rappers on TV that have just passed away unexpectedly like that. I mean, we know about Eddie Guerrero and a few other examples from the past. Uh, just to have a guy that was featured on top in AEW and kind of finally, finally getting his uh, his main event sort of spot in a in a wrestling company, and then to uh, to pass away at such a young age, it's tragic. And uh, we send our uh, wishes and uh, good thoughts out to the Huber family. Definitely so. But uh, as I said, uh, you know, people have done such a remarkable job of honoring him and talking about him and everything like that. Both AEW uh, did a nice tribute to him and a lot of podcasts have done a great job of talking about the career of Brody Lee and the person that he was. So, you know, our hats off to all the great work that's already been done and accomplished there. So we just wanted to give an opportunity to send our best wishes to the Hoover family and uh, our hats off to Brody Lee for what you did accomplish. Uh, from there, we're going to be talking about Danny Hodge in a minute, but I also want to mention that later on in the show, we will have our review of MLW episode 113. I know we're a little bit behind the mark, but hey, 
that's what Papa Smokes and I are like, a little bit behind the mark all the time, but that's okay because we love doing this shit, and we're going to have fun doing it here today. But uh, before that, Papa Smokes, we lost a legend recently, and it seems like we did a lot of this in 2020, and now we're doing this again in 2021. Danny Hodge passing away. Yeah, yeah, another uh, yeah, uh, horrible uh, passing in the professional wrestling world. This was a guy, however, that was 88 years old, so... Uh, it's not, I suppose, as shocking or tragic that it happened, but uh, he's got a lot of things uh, gone on this past a couple of weeks about Brody Lee, but not as much about Danny Hodd. Like we're discussing there, there, there isn't a whole lot of stuff about Hodge because of uh, the time in which he was active in wrestling in the 50s, 60s, and 70s kind of thing. There's not a whole lot of tape on him, but uh, this guy can't be overlooked for his uh, contributions to professional wrestling. He was basically the uh, Kurt Angle of his day, and uh, and uh, he did a lot to uh, help solidify the foundations of professional wrestling and, and the whole crossover between uh, uh, amateur kind of shoot wrestling and, and the style of professional wrestling. So Hodge will never be forgotten for that kind of stuff. Well, and his, his amateur wrestling career is just absolutely unbeatable in so many ways, too. Like, I mean, this is a Olympic silver medalist in the middleweight uh, class of men's freestyle wrestling in the Olympic Games. Uh, also, what, was it not uh, three times that, uh, in fact, they were back-to-back -back NCAA division champion? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, went to three Olympics, too. Uh, uh, only won the silver in uh, 1956, but... Uh, Man, if you're making that American Wrestling Olympic team, you, you are one of the best in the world for sure. Definitely so. So, But that was, uh, that was his amateur career. Let's uh, focus a little bit on his uh, pro wrestling career. What what can you tell us? Because like you said, there isn't a lot that you can find. I did uh, a lot of looking around Papa Smokes. I'm not as familiar with the uh, Danny Hodge career and uh, hoping you can maybe fill in some of the gaps here for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, after such a successful amateur career i mean the guy at went to university of oklahoma and was 46 and 0 uh that's just almost unbelievable uh probably rivaled only by uh i was dan gable who uh went 80 some and oh but uh yeah hodge will always be remembered as one of the best amateurs uh, in america ever to uh, wrestle so when it came to pro wrestling uh, by this time, it was 1959, and, and he was trained by Leroy McGurk and uh, Ed Strangler Lewis, so uh, a couple of the best trainers you could ever have in professional wrestling, especially at that time. And uh, he had, uh, Hodge had bulked up a little bit uh, for pro wrestling just to have the, the you know, the, the look was more important than the uh, uh, chiseled uh, physique that, that would uh, belie some speed in the amateur thing. He, he got up to uh, six feet, 227 pounds, pretty solid man. And uh, he started in some of the southern states, uh, as we've seen a lot of these uh, retro wrestlers did. That was the place to get your chops, was all through Florida and Georgia and Kentucky and Tennessee. And, uh, and uh, Hodge was a pretty famous. He, he'd been on the cover of Sports Illustrated for his uh, amateur wrestling. I think he was the first and one of the only amateur wrestlers ever to make uh, SI's cover story. So he was in demand, and lots of uh, promoters all over America wanted him. And uh, he went throughout the NWA territories, and uh, one of his, his first big opponent was Angelo Savoldi. And they feuded on and off for years uh, over the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Championship, which uh, kind of fell out of favor uh, by the time of the 80s and such. But that used to be a hotly contested uh, belt, kind of like a cruiserweight type thing. It would be the, the smaller guys, not the super heavyweights going for that one. And therefore, you'd see a lot of uh, quick, fast action in the ring. And uh, by 1962, uh, Danny Hodge was very much in demand all over the country. And, and in, in uh, 1962, uh, terms of money, he was making uh, somewhere around 80K per year. So, I mean, that's a lot of money. Like, I don't think a lot of guys make that this year, uh, even in this year, if you're not working for one of the major, major feds. So as a, as a independent uh, 
pro wrestler making 80k in the early 60s like this guy was a huge star there probably weren't even uh, some basketball and baseball and boxing stars that were making that much so it just goes to show you how respected hodge was and how much in demand he was from promoters at the time oh definitely so and i mean that is a large amount because even uh in reading the book that we're going to be reviewing later down the road here, uh, The Eighth Wonder of the World, they started talking about the amounts that Andre was making during some of his pinnacles of his career. And, yeah, it was a, a a larger chunk than 80K a year, but it wasn't so much larger when you consider the gap of about uh, 15 to 20 years in between when you start to look at it. You could almost argue that Hodge actually was, you know, in some ways just as successful uh, when it came to what he was uh, bringing in. Yeah, it's mind-boggling to think of, too. Uh, uh, and just the respect that had, Hodge had throughout the business. Uh, uh, all the other workers were scared of him. Uh, he was a very tough shooter. He was known to have uh, a, a bit of a temper, too. And he was also very protective about the business of professional wrestling. So he was a guy that if you wanted to book or sign Danny up to your promotion, he was going to look to it first and make sure that you didn't have any funny stuff on there or any believable uh, angles or anything like that. He would not appear with, or he would not uh, have a moment like that. And uh, uh, there, there are a couple of incidents of him uh, uh, protecting the business physically too. And I know that's uh, not really a thing anymore, not certainly not smiled upon anymore, but uh, Hodge protected the business that he loved and, uh, yeah, if you wanted to have some heat with Danny Hodge, you're in big trouble. The the guy could uh, beat you up in a number of different ways, and he did that to a few wrestlers that uh, got on the wrong side of him. Or he'd just get his uh, get his dad to beat you up too, by the sounds of it as well. I mean, reading the story, story speaking of Angelo uh, Savaldi there, that they were actually having a boxing match because Danny Hodge had a boxing uh, career as well too. And uh, during that matchup in particular, it was uh, Hodge's father who came into the ring and stabbed Savaldi with a pen knife right in the middle of the ring. Yeah, yeah. He, Hodge had smartened his dad up to the biz, which, which again, shows the uh, level of commitment there, too. There were many wrestlers back then that didn't smarten up their family or even their wives or their kids, so that uh, there was heat on the inside sometimes. And, uh, yeah, like you say, that boxing match was... Uh, it was kind of a work shoot, I suppose. Like they were going to box seriously to some extent, but I, I, they were having a few spots where there was some uh, shenanigans that might have been against the rules. And they obviously had a, a worked finish as well. But uh, when Savoldi started, uh, you know, thumping Hodge's eyes on the ropes and stuff, uh, Danny Hodge's dad was having none of it. And yeah, cut Savoldi pretty good to the tune of 70-some stitches with that knife and uh, got arrested and the whole thing. And Hodge had to explain to the uh, police, and I think he got his dad out of that hot water. But it uh, just goes to show the, the difference in the business at that time, that how uh, protected it was, how, how important it was to keep that keep those pardon me keep the uh behind the scenes business of the professional wrestling uh, to be in amongst the workers and to no one else especially not the fans but these guys didn't even smarten up their families and it's just testament to how different it is today yeah definitely so and that all led up to their uh matchup for the nwa world junior heavyweight championship which uh then hodge went on to win and then uh became an uh an eight-time nwa world junior heavyweight champion yeah, yeah. I just again, it shows the heat around that belt at the time that uh, people were actually invested in this uh, lighter weight title and uh, some of the exciting matches that hit it. It had so there you go, a, a feud uh, that went on for years and years with uh, Hodge and Savoldi trading that light light heavyweight title back uh, back and forth a few times and uh, wow, good stuff. And uh, he'll always be remembered for that. Yeah, and he's been inducted into just about every uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame that you can name. And, uh, I mean, he was part of the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame, obviously. Um, he's been inducted into the International Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame as of this year. He'll be part of the class of 2021, uh, as well as the uh, Luthrez, uh, sorry, Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame as well, too. So a lot of accomplishments here outside of uh, just being the guy who could crush apples with his bare hands. Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to bring up uh, 
one incident too of uh, I was going to say that that Hodge even made it into a WWE Hall of Fame, which is kind of surprising because uh, you know he doesn't uh, Vince doesn't seem to uh, you know uh, value the best wrestlers in his Hall of Fame. It's more about a marketing thing, I think. Uh, Hodge must have been inducted in between uh, Sonny and the Birdman Coco Beware or something <laughs> like that. But uh, at any rate, uh, I, I saw something on Raw years ago. Um, I'm going to estimate this was maybe 2007 or somewhere in there, but uh, uh, Danny Hodge made an appearance on Raw as an old man when they were in Oklahoma. Uh, he, he came onto the show and they, uh, they invited him into the ring to make an appearance and Hodge came in at age 70 something and sprang in over the top rope looking like one of those super fit old men kind of thing and it got a huge uh, ovation in Oklahoma where he's forever a celebrity and uh, this of course this little celebration of course was interrupted by uh, Triple H and Ric Flair and Randy Orton and uh, the guys came out to uh, to mock Dan- Danny Hodge and ended up uh, kind of slapping him around a little bit and I remember thinking at that time I, I didn't even know much about as much about Hodge as I do now, but I remember thinking, Jesus, if those guys ever actually pissed off Danny Hodge, he would slap the living shit out of all three of those guys, even at his advanced age. So uh, I, I guess they should be pretty glad that was a work. Uh, I don't think those three could have even put put it over uh, Hodge in his old age there. But uh, just a little anecdote that it, at least. Uh, at least Vince and the WWE uh, recognized the greatness of Danny Hodge. Maybe I don't think he even worked there uh, for Vince's dad at any point. But, uh, yeah, still some respect given, and I, I'm all about that. Uh, Hodge will never be forgotten in the professional wrestling world, and, and rightly so. Yeah, and I believe the way the, the WWE Hall of Fame works, and again, yeah, it's all, like you said, looking for you know names that they can draw up and spectacle type stuff, so it's not exactly the most reliant hall of fame in professional wrestling but they tend to have one older name somebody who didn't necessarily ever work for the mcmahon family or something like that somebody that they can kind of honor so that they can try to i think they try to capture that crowd of people that remember the old good old days and stuff like that and they want them to be as invested in their hall of fame ceremony as what uh you know the younger crowds will be when they start inducting like you said coco beware and sunny and who else they, uh, you know, might pump up there, the Bella Twins or whatever they consider to be a legend these days, which is a far cry from what a true legend actually is most of the time. Yeah, well, we just saw this Legends program on WWE just this past week where they brought back some uh, quote-unquote greats from the past. And, uh, wow, the uh, definition of legend has changed a lot so from, from what I think, uh, including having people like Alicia Fox on there and such as legends, but uh, ah, what are you going to do, right? Like, I think the WWE Hall of Fame even separated it into a a legends wing and then a main wing, so they don't even have to show the legends uh, inductions on on TV anymore or uh, waste their time with these old fellows from the past that no one remembers. They they put them in their own little wing now, which kind of sucks because then there's really little recognition for them. Nobody gets to see them or hear their speech. And, uh, and then they can concentrate on their main hall of fame, which is just, yeah, is obviously all about uh, selling merch and uh, having uh, video collections and such, uh, which they, they have their more current or more recent stars. They have so much tape. So then you get, yeah, you get Danny Hodge relegated to the legends wing, but then you get the Bella twins with all the, uh, with all the accolades and everything, it's it's completely upside down and ass backwards. But what are you going to do? That's a lot of what WWE, WWE is these days. Yeah, and I mean, they're so in the tank that they had to do this Legends Night and bring out what, I mean, again, your definition of legend is really stretched thin nowadays, like you said, with most of the names. And no discredit to some of the people out there. Don't, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people that will be legends one day, possibly. Uh, give them enough time and stuff like that. I don't imagine Alicia Fox will fall quite into that category in my personal humble opinion. But again, I, you know, I don't make the rules and that's just what they did last night. And man, I I didn't watch last night, but I kind of figured it was going to be a shit show. And I believe it turned out to be an absolute shit show from what I've seen on social media this morning, Pop Smokes. 
Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. And again, that's I, I don't watch it anymore for exactly those kinds of reasons. It's more exasperating and infuriating to me than anything else. But uh, I, I hear the scuttlebutt on the on social media and I, I see some of the clips and stuff and it, it just makes me really glad not to watch that stuff anymore. It's been a long time and it, it, it feels good. The, the only clip I saw from last night that I actually enjoyed seeing didn't even happen on the actual show itself. They had one of their little bullshit raw talk interview th- segments afterwards and they had the leader of Retribution Ali on there and man, he cut the best promo I've seen out of anybody in the last couple weeks for WWE as far as that's concerned and yet buried on an afterthought show basically yeah yeah well who knows uh, from what I hear the the product is at a very low point right now in ratings and creativity and uh, I mean that's partly to do with COVID and the n- no live crowds and stuff and it's just tough for wrestling companies all over you know when you see the WWE suffering and losing money you know that the climate is bad and the, I think it's just uh, wrestling audiences are down overall and uh, that's partly due to COVID and all that stuff but uh, really it seems like there's a lot of hours of crappy product going on TV and the, even today's audience that are they're raised on that kind of stuff are just not having this right now so yeah. it really seems like a kind of a watershed moment for WWE we'll have to see what happens especially oh. with the Vince getting on and all that. There's going to be some big changes in the next couple of years, and we'll we'll be there to watch and see what happens with WWE. Oh, for sure. And you know, I just want to give you the gist of this promo, Pop Smokes, because I think you would have enjoyed this one. Yeah. So all he's out there talking, and he he starts complaining that of three hours of Monday Night Raw, and people like himself and these young guys that are in the company don't get to go out there, and they're replaced by these guys who can barely even walk to the ring anymore who have no no effect and not, no business being out there in the first place. And he goes, with all due respect to the generations before me that paved the way, he goes, thank you for paving the way, but when is this company going to let me finally start walking on that path and become the star I deserve to be? And to which the, uh, the I think, I can't remember who it was that rebuttaled him and said, well, didn't you hear the pop that Hulk Hogan got when uh, he came to the ring? And all he goes, yeah, I heard the crowd noise that was pumped into the arena there by the uh, technicians in the oh. back. <laughs> like, wow. it, it was honestly some of the most entertaining thing I've seen someone do on a microphone, and yet, once again, buried off of the main roster, not allowing a guy like that to excel when he says something like that. Yeah, that, that's a good one, Munson. and that sounds like a bit of a shoot, too, and I, I bet you the fans uh, resonated with that as well, and uh, saying some hard truths there, too, but also getting heat and getting a, a, a minor pop out of it, at least. Uh, good job by Mustafa. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I like that kid. I, I hope the best for him, too, so, I mean, hopefully that promo might get noticed enough that they might do something interesting with him. I think he's got a good work, yes. work rate. Yeah, yeah. Does he remind you just a little bit of uh, Rocket Shoes Novak? He does have that look of Rocket Shoes Novak, doesn't yeah. he? But yeah, no, style. I. Yeah, style, and style and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah but no, yeah. no, no discredit to either one of them. I mean, uh, you know, fuck, Tony, Tony's wonderful. Love that kid. So I mean, you know, no, no harm in those comparisons whatsoever. Oh yeah, man, that's a compliment for sure. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Ed, we got a little off course there, but uh, Danny Hodge, anything else that we want to add before we head on to our review of MLW here? No, oh, no, but uh, just, again, as we like to do in this podcast, we're not going to do stick with the obvious stuff, but we want to help educate and help inform any of our listeners out there that are interested in the old days of wrestling and uh I mean, Danny Hodge is one that should never be forgotten. This is this is a guy that existed in the business when there was still an extremely gray area between what was real Olympic wrestling and what was kind of uh, professional uh, setup wrestling a little bit. And this guy existed in the gray area of that uh, to quite a lot of success. And uh, I think there's always a place for wrestlers like that in the business, including today. We thought a guy like Kurt Angle get out there and shoot gravel some of his opponents and uh, show some of that Olympic skill. And uh, Hodge was just like that uh, uh, larger-than-life character that came in and uh, 
and just showed everybody the skill that he had in uh, his previous sports life, uh, transitioned that over to the professional game and uh, made a fantastic career out of it. Uh, R.I.P. Danny Hodge. Very much so. All the respect to him and everything he's done. And we're talking about some of that style, that, you know, great athletic Olympic style and stuff. And you can see some of that on display from some guys who have brought some of that uh, MMA style and everything like that to their careers. Yeah. A lot of that being seen in Major League Wrestling, MLW. And that brings us to the next segment of the show. We're talking about MLW episode 113, Papa Smokes. We're going to do our review here today for everybody. So uh, we're going to get started on it, uh, kick things off. Once again, the focus of MLW at the moment has been Contra. And so uh, they kicked off with the uh, Contra promo here, uh, talking about a new wave of soldiers that is being readied and prepared for the battle against it, Major League Wrestling. Yeah, and this isn't Joseph Samael so uh, convincing and scary when he cuts a promo just talking about Contra's evil global plans and the introducing these new soldiers is it's terrifying in a way because they've already got an extremely powerful faction going and they've got a they exhibit a lot of control on mlw fusion so uh uh now introducing mads kruger the black hand of contra as their new talent and uh and talking about possibly more uh contra it's uh men in black uh, uniforms and such uh, jumping around and attacking people and uh, bringing people out in body bags. It just begs the question as to how far do Contra's uh, tendrils go through the wrestling world and through the world and, and how many new monsters might we see coming into MLW. It's, it's actually a little bit scary. It certainly is. And, you know, I want gi to give a lot of credit to MLW Major League Wrestling uh, not only for the uh, like the in-ring stuff they've been able to do, but let's take uh, Joseph Samael, for example, or Zelina De La Renta, which have been very focused on Major League Wrestling every single week at the moment. And we're going to learn more about that, talking about other upcoming shows as well, too. But they're utilizing them without either one of them ever having to be at the arena, in the building, and participating in that capacity. The videos that they're cutting... Uh, behind the scenes, wherever they're cutting them from, from their home or whatever studio they're doing it at, has fit into the show perfectly without making it seem tacky, cheesy, or anything like that. It fits. The storylines work. It's pieced together and edited really nicely. Great job by MLW for being able to utilize people without having to bring them all into the building at the same time. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, yeah, they've obviously, uh, they're trying to uh, have a safe environment for their tapings and uh, not have a whole bunch of people from the roster there at the same time. They've obviously uh, catered their booking towards that so that, uh, yeah, they, they're not using the entire uh, roster right now because probably of uh, COVID concerns. So they're, they're uh, highlighting these uh, four or five kind of big feuds they have and starting some new talent and everything. And, uh, stars they, they have can do their shit from uh, uh, remote locations such as uh, who knows where Joseph Sam I know is filming his stuff I mean, he's always on the search for new uh, tap for Contra but uh, Selena De La Renta doing those nice promos from the Aztec ruins and she's doing the uh, kind of Mexican witchcraft as she's uh, as she's summoning her uh, helper we'll speak about that a little bit later but uh, I like it, and I think it's good. Same thing with the Von Erics. They've been doing uh, promos from, you know, their training in uh, Hawaii and all that stuff. And uh, I think it's good just to keep them involved, to keep the fans' minds on them, but uh, uh, not having to have them physically present in the building. And none of it has to run for long extended periods of time. I mean, we're talking quick, you know, 90-second videos. Like, these are minute-and-a-half spots just to get the point across and keep people interested, like you said. And it's been fantastic. Great promo from Yosef Samael for building up Contra and making us interested in this whole storyline to see where it uh, unfolds. And then we kick off the, the matches. We're getting match number one, Zenshi versus Calvin Tankman. And first thing I wrote down in my notes here, Pop Smokes, poor Zenshi. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, uh, you could see where this match was going to head, but Zenshi looks like a decent fast and agile, had some uh, aerial tactics 
that he was going to try, but as we've seen in the in his previous match, Tankman lives up to his name. He is a tank. He's massive, and he's not having any aerial maneuvers from a smaller guy or anything like that. Uh, quick win with the Tankman driver. A quick promo after that, uh, talking about heavyweight hustle. That's what uh, Tankman is, and uh, man, he's two of his debut. So obviously, starting this guy off strong, they've got plans for Calvin Tankman, and uh, we'll see. I don't think he made it on to uh, uh, Coliseum uh, uh, pay per view, but uh, maybe he is in an match. We'll see. But uh, obviously, they're starting guy off to be a big force in uh, MLW. Definitely so, and they do a great job of building guys up and not uh, immediately throwing them into the big picture right away. I mean, sometimes they do. Obviously, Mads Kruger needed to be thrown into the big picture right away, and we'll talk more on him as we go along and everything like that. But, uh, you know, Tankman, they brought him in. They're doing a nice job setting up these matches where clearly he's going to go over, uh, giving him those nice promos at the end again. I like the heavyweight hustle. That's, That's a good name. I like the heavyweight hustle name. That's good branding right there, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, looking for big things from Calvin Tankman. Certainly so. So, yeah, going on from there, uh, we're go back to talk about Zelina De La Renta. We're talking about the uh, summoning, and she's uh, filming these from the Aztec ruins, as she's saying, and doing this summoning of somebody. She's bringing somebody in, and, man, the name that uh, Ben dropped, I can't, honestly, I can't remember because I didn't put it on my notes. Did she drop the name on this episode, or is that coming up on the next one? Yes, she did. She called him Pascal Mendoza. Okay. Which I then, had, which I then had to look up to see what his wrestling name is. I don't know if you want to drop that yet, but uh, yeah, they, this uh, is coming across as a fairly creepy part too. And and Celine is excellent, I and mean, she's she looks the part. Yes. Uh, an evil. Woman. She's got pentagram with a candle, body knife, and all that, and the. You know, sometimes I, I, sometimes I'm a little bit questionable, questionable about this uh, cinematic type treatment and everything. But I think in this it works. It, she actually is at some Aztec ruins in Mexico, so they've got her on location there, and uh, this is what she's like. She, uh, she's evil and she wants uh, complete domination and control over MLW once she gets. Uh, gets back into the swing of things in, in the, in the Federation. And, uh, you can see that she's, uh, summoning some kind of, uh, new wrestler or a new help for her, uh, for her, uh, uh, her promotions group kind of thing, or her little faction that she's uh, had before, which is kind of, uh, falling apart before the lockdown thing. So she's getting it going again. And, uh, yeah, this summoning, uh, I mean, it's a creepy spot and I like it. Yeah, it is done really well. I mean, as far as cinematic stuff goes, we've had our issues with it. But, I mean, again, this is more in terms of promo. This isn't like a cinematic match or anything like that. She's summoning, and uh, we will drop the name. I don't know if it was said on this episode completely, but it sounds like uh, we're going to be seeing Mil Mertes. Mertes. Is that how I pronounce it, Pop Smokes? Yeah, I would say it, Muertes. But, yeah, yeah, Mil Muertes. Yeah. The thousand man killer yeah yeah and anybody unfamiliar with this man this man is an absolute beast uh, you know i mean we could honestly say a walking legend in the ring as far as legends go these days um this guy's been around a long time and he's got a lot of credibility behind him in terms of like uh, this guy is broken and shattered a lot of people's bones over the years in the ring yeah yeah just one look at um mil muertes shows that he's uh He's got that big muscular physique. He's a big dude. He's a, an evil heel character. And, uh, yeah, like you say, he's got a reputation of, of extreme violence throughout uh, Mexico in his professional wrestling career. And uh, um, he, you can see that Mill's also not uh, a young man. And, uh, this guy's looking good coming in here. I like the pick. I like the... Uh, what they've acquired here and i think he's perfect for uh selena de la renta's faction she favors the kind of uh mexican-based wrestlers and uh i i just can't wait to see mil muertes in a match uh i'm not sure who she's going to be feuding with i i assume it's uh 
probably Conan and anyone that's under Conan's tutelage at this time. But uh, yeah, Mil Muerte is headed to MLW, and that's pretty exciting. It will be for sure. So uh, from there, we get a debut matchup. This is Team Filthy, the team of, I believe it's Kevin Koo and Dominic Gabrini, if I got those names correct there, Pop Smokes. Yeah, yeah, I think the team name is called Violence is Forever. That's right, yes, definitely. Violence is Forever and taking on the team of Jason Duggan or Dugan and our boy there, Robert Martyr, uh, always the martyr in the matchup, but he's back again for another one. Yeah, yeah, and obviously this is looking like a pretty big time upset uh, or a mismatch kind of, but yeah, we're just debuting uh, Garini and Koo, so uh, we'll give them some opponents that they can do something with here. And uh, yeah, we knew this match probably wasn't going to be anything fancy. Uh, Garini and Koo are both shooters. You, Dominic Garini, well known for his judo and jujitsu background. Kevin Koo, kind of the same thing, martial arts background. And uh, this didn't last long. Uh, the shooters uh, went hard on Dugan and Martyr, and uh, and got the win. So uh, a debut win for Violence is Forever. Looking pretty okay. I, I, I think they need more time to solidify as a team and to get their own characters going. But uh, uh, what did you think? I, I like it because I, I like the shoot style, the uh, martial arts background. I really enjoy that. I think it'll work well with Filthy Tom Lawler bringing that faction together and stuff like that. Uh, I don't want them to rush it, though. Bring a build like you're saying to these guys as a tag team. Don't rush them to the top of the mountain just yet. I'd like to see these guys continue to take on some obvious uh, opponents that they can get the best of and then maybe hand them somebody that uh, is in that tag division that they can go over top of down the line once they get a little bit more experience before, you know, considering they consider having them go up against guys like the Von Erics down the road. Yeah, yeah. Looking good, sounding good. Uh, get that tag team division going a little bit with some new teams. And, uh, yeah, now Team Filthy looking stronger, too. They got an actual tag team in there. And, uh, yeah, we'll see. They'll be after the Von Eriks in no time. Yeah, and, I mean, these guys look dangerous. They definitely speak wonders in the ring. And, you know, they've got a guy like Filthy Tom Waller leading that stable, and the guy's got charisma. So, I mean, that really helps bring it together and should help you know, with uh, Ku and Gabrini helping them to adjust to the style of wrestling that MLW brings and being able to uh, work on their development as a team as well, too. Yeah, and like uh, like we've said about MLW before, they don't so much care about the matchup of, of how these teams are going to work together. They're just going to put them in there and see what happens kind of thing. And that gives it that more real sporting where sometimes the teams don't match up that well. and uh, But then you got to see what happens. You can wrestle through the adversity and, and you can get the win out of it. It uh, gives a, a convincing kind of presentation. And I like the I like the sports-based presentation of MLW. And, and Violence is Forever is, is one of those teams that, uh, that really showcases that. Definitely so. Dope. Yeah, a great debut from them. And then after that, uh, we got to hear from Leo Rush, the challenger to My Myron Reed's uh, middleweight championship at the Kings of Coliseum. So Leo Rush dropping that promo, uh, helping to hype this match up. Uh, is it just me, Papa Smokes, or does Leo Rush on a microphone really start to get under your skin? And it, it is the character. I don't know if this is what he's like in real life, but man, that character is the kind of guy that you just kind of want to see him get kicked in the head in the middle of the matchup. Oh, yeah, he plays heel so wonderfully. Was this the promo where he's sitting in his uh, limo kind of going to the uh, going to the uh, recording studio because, of course, he's a rap star and all that, and he's doing the wrestling and the music at the same time, and he's just got that extreme arrogance about him, and uh, he, he, you, can, you feel like he's laughing at you all the time, and it, He's an annoying little jerk, and it comes across nicely, and that, that's the kind of thing that builds heat. Uh, I, I've heard that it's not much of an act that he is uh, an annoying jerk in the dressing room. <laughs> I, I don't I don't have confirmation of that because I haven't been in a dressing room with him, but he has that reputation, and 
all the better if there's some uh, if there's some real heat kind of behind a gimmick like that. Yeah, definitely. So, and this was the one in the car on the way to the studio as well. And he mentions about how it was Court Bauer reached out to him and wanted him to come in, and he made this big deal that it would be on his terms only, and that was the reason for the Kings of Coliseum being switched from last Wednesday to this Wednesday, January the 6th, was because they had to wait until Leo Rush had the time to show up, and that Court Bauer basically bowed to Leo Rush in his debut kind of thing. Yeah, good stuff. Like, any time your heel is uh, claiming to be a bigger star than the, the entire federation he's in, it, I think it's a good tactic, and the, the fans will be pissed off about that. Definitely so. So that uh, helped build that matchup up. And then from there, we got uh, Alicia was doing an interview with Hammerstone, who, you know, talking about Mods Kruger, uh, you know, building up the wanting to challenge Mods Kruger, saying he is back, he's ready to go, drops the challenge for Kings of Coliseum to go one on one with Mods Kruger. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as Hammerstone said in his promo there, the he wants Kruger for revenge for uh, injuring him and sneak attacking him at the uh, uh, premiere episode of Fusion a couple of weeks ago. But he also sees this as uh, this match against Mads Kruger. This is like step one to taking down Contra. So again, you get an idea of what Alexander Hammerstone's long-term plans are. He's got a match against Mads. We were already talking about what a hellacious match this is going to be and what a competitive match, but Hammerstone already looking forward ahead to this. Again, his his end game is, is Jacob Fatu and the world title, but he's going to go through Contra. And I, I think it's a good idea, too, to uh, maybe get some of Contra's uh, soldiers out of the way so that they can't be uh, helping Fatu in the eventual title match and stuff. Uh, Hammerstone wants to go through them all, so I presume he's going to go after uh, Mads Kruger, Simon Gotch, uh, Joseph Samuel, and whoever else they throw at him and, uh, on his way to the world heavyweight title at Jacob Fatu. Yeah, you know it's building to it, and we're all looking forward to it for sure. So that match uh, set in stone for the Kings of Coliseum. Mads Kruger going one-on-one -on -one with Alexander Hammerstone. Uh, by the time this has been released, likely that has already been taken place, so... Definitely check that one out uh, if you haven't already. Uh, last but not least, definitely not least, we get back to the Opera Cup, and this is the semifinals now, Papa Smokes. We've been covering the opening round matchups here on Ring Respect, and now we've got Richard Holiday taking on Loki in the semifinals here. Um, why don't you bring us into this one a little bit, and then we'll discuss it and uh, get to who won it and what we think going forward. Sure, sure. Uh, we've talked about Richard Holiday before. I, I... He was a member of the uh, faction Dynasty with uh, Alexander Hammerstone and MJF, which doesn't seem to, I'm not sure if they're really continuing with that uh, faction anymore. It, it kind of seems like they might just uh, start to go on their own. But anyway, Richard Holiday uh, hasn't really had that breakout match or moment that I've been looking for to, you know, sort of cement him as a, as one of the top talents in MLW, but I like this guy. He's, he's got, he's tall. He's got uh, strength. He's got a good body on him. He's got a good look. His uh, his uh, fundamentals are pretty good in uh, professional wrestling. But here he's in tough against Loki. This is we all know uh, Loki or Senshi as he used to be known, or uh, or uh, any of the various uh, aliases he's gone under. He's a He's a veteran of the ring. He's one of these guys that kind of walks the line between uh, professional wrestling and kind of like more of a real style of shoot fighting. I think you got to be careful all the time and protect yourself when you're in the ring with Loki. So this is a big match for Holiday and, and a tough one too. Um, He's got a lot of skills and, uh, and a lot of intensity. And we saw Holiday in this match use his size and strength to his advantage. Um, and we saw a low key coming back with martial arts strikes and martial arts style grappling, but uh, ultimately low key looking to finish high in, in this year's Opera Cup as well. You know, he made it to the semifinals last year. Um, he's, he was looking strong. I, I had him in my mind as one of the guys that could, that could possibly win it this year. 
and he advanced in this round with the Warriors' way, double foot stomp on their holiday's uh, torso, and there we go. Low key advances to the finals. What did you think of this match? I liked the match. I think it was a good display for Richard Holiday. Again, I'm I'm starting to really enjoy him more and more the more I see him. Uh, I, it's great to see that he's got to be the longest running Caribbean champion in his wrestling history at this point. Um, you know, I I liked this. It was good. Um, low key is one of those guys where it's like I know I'm gonna get a good match out of him. I've never been, he's never been huge on my list of guys that I like, I really need to see a match of, even though I know you're going to get quality out of them and, you know, be a mil, little bit more realistic type matchup than what you're going to get out of the modern day wrestling for sure. I never loved low key on a promo. That That's the one thing I think Richard Holiday mops the floor with uh, low key when it comes to promo cutting. Uh, low key seems, he it, it almost feels like he's a little bit soft in his promo, like his voice just doesn't carry to really deliver that oomph that he needs when he's talking about his passion for the ring. But man, the way MLW built this thing and the way this delivered, I really, at this point, and without going into the reviews we're going to get to uh, in a future episode, this felt like Low Key's Opera Cup. Yeah. And it's just... I see what... Oh, sorry. I see what you mean, Munson. Yeah, he had, the, uh, he had the different gear. They brought that up that he's been... Uh... He's uh, his main trainer is Chono from uh, Japan, and he had the uh, low key wore that uh, grappling gear from Chono's gym in uh, in Japan. And uh, it, as the commentators told us, uh, he felt uh, low key felt like he let down Masahiro Chono, and he didn't win the Opera Cup last year. So they, he came at it with uh, with an intensity this year, and you knew when he was wearing the gear of uh, representing his trainer that he was not uh, not interested in taking a loss whatsoever. And yeah, I have to agree with your statement there. I, I kind of had the feeling that Loki was going to win it all this year, uh, all around. And uh, this match did nothing to dispel that feeling. Uh, taking out a larger and stronger man uh, like Richard Holiday and. Uh, Finishing him off clean with your finisher, like that's really some good stuff and very impressive from low key. And uh, we'll obviously uh, finish our reviews of what happens in the Opera Cup, but yeah, low key looking really, really great in the semifinals here. Yeah, and you know what? At the same time, Richard Holiday looked strong too. I mean, we got to see a lot of his technical skill uh, involved here as well too. So I don't think he looked weak. I mean, again, Maybe I was looking for that uh, that big match you're talking about or that one to really set him on fire, but it, it, it could still happen. I imagine he's still got youth on his side, very much so, and he's starting to look better each day, so I think uh, we, we will get there. I think it's coming. Uh, he's definitely a focal point for MLW and a selling point for them, and I think with the way things are going, we will see more of Richard Holiday in 2021. Yeah, just a quick note on Holiday, too. I think he... Uh, in that faction dynasty was kind of overshadowed by the other guys in there, uh, including Maxwell Jacob Friedman, who we know uh, has gone on to uh, some big things lately, and also Alexander Hammerstone, whose popularity was building all that time too. So I think he might have been overshadowed by his stable mates a little bit there, but uh, I also think that uh, he's come along quite nicely uh, since we've last seen him before lockdown and then uh, now we're seeing a, a competitive side of uh, Richard Holiday that's looking really good. And, uh, yeah, like you say, I think big things are coming for him, whether he's in his faction or not, uh, in 2021. Definitely so. So we'll have to see how that all unfolds. We'll get to his more MLW reviews coming up in a uh, future episode of Ring Respect Radio. But for now, that brings an end to Ring Respect Radio and to MLW 113 review here. Hope everybody enjoyed this episode. Hope you're enjoying all the wrestling that's out there available for you these days. And on behalf of myself and Papa Smokes, we want to thank you for tuning in once again to Ring Respect Radio. Again, if you haven't done so already, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Click on the bell notification so you know anytime we release new material. And do us a favor, reach out on social media and let the world know about Ring Respect Radio. We're doing this as much as possible, bringing you the content you love about professional wrestling from yesteryear and from today as well, too. Thank you for joining, and we'll talk to you again soon. Hey, everybody. Just a uh, end note here uh, in case we uh, didn't get this through in the episode. Uh, it was made... Uh, notable to me afterwards that I absolutely missed over something in our notes here that there was another match from 113 and we're talking about the Von Eriks 
Uh, they were taking on uh, Jacob Fatu and Simon Gotch there with the titles on the line. Uh, let's uh, talk for a minute about this one, Papa Smokes, this one uh, ending in kind of a bizarre way. Yeah, this one, and probably a team title match. They made it fairly clear that uh, uh, bad blood was still brewing between these teams, even from before the COVID shutdown in March. Uh, the, the, they've had a long-running rivalry. The, the Von Eriks have also promised to take down a uh, contra unit at some point. So, uh, yeah, this was not going to be a scientific encounter or uh, anything with any good blood around it. So uh, Von Eriks uh, came out and uh, defended their championship, which they've had for over a year. Um, in this match, Contra isolated Ross Von Erich for a good part of the match, uh, got some heat on him, uh, kept him in their corner with some double team moves, worked him over a lot. Finally, Marshall got the hot tag, uh, put the claw on Simon Gotch outside the ring and then kind of claw slammed him through a table and uh this match uh, the referee had no control over uh, ended up in a no contest but uh, we had a huge schmozzle at the end with uh, uh team filthy and violence is forever coming out and then we had a basically a large uh, brawl between uh, the tag teams on MF mlw so just like we were talking before, it's obvious they are trying to light a fire under their tag team division, and uh, they want to feature that more prominently. So here you go. Here's uh, some of the main teams in MLW uh, smacking it out in a match here. What did you think of this one, Watson? I thought it was uh, it was good. It was well built. Again, it's uh, that no contest thing helps in so many ways because you didn't have to have the Von Eriks uh, going over clean or anything like that on, you know, Contra, especially with having the world champion Jacob Fatu there. The only way I could see that plausible is if they would have pinned Simon Gotch at some point. But the idea of going to a no contest and displaying all the teams and the animosity between them, really, uh, it really helped get them all on display and show what your tag division is possibly made of. So, Good stuff. Just another good dust up to have uh, in the weeks before a pay-per-view just to get the fans thinking, get the fans excited, then uh, who's going to brawl and who's going to win. And this is one of those uh, matches you do just to uh, to hype up your pay-per-view and everybody involved in it. And uh, yeah, they did a good job of it. It's going to be mayhem. Uh, definitely a fantastic job. And thank you again, Bob Smokes, for uh, making the correction there. I missed that on my notes, and you were correct. That match did take place as well, too. So I'm glad we had a chance to get back on here and uh, get this recorded as well for the end of this episode so everybody knows that we did watch all the way through and check it all out. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for uh, once again tuning in to the next part of this uh, episode. And uh, once again, thank you for all your love and support and for subscribing. And we'll see you again soon.